السلام علیکم آن بہاف آف دی اسلامک ریسرچ فاؤنڈیشن وی ویلکم یو آل ٹو ٹو ڈیز پروگرام وی اسٹارٹ دا پروگرام ود دا کراد بائی برادر اشرف محمدی السلام علیکم ورحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم الذین یأکلون الربا لا یقومون الا کما یقوم الذی يتحبته الشيطان من المس ذلك بأنهم قالوا إنما البيع مثل الربا وأحو الله البيع وحرم الربا فمن جاءه موعزة من ربه فانتهى فله ما سلف وأمره إلا الله ومن عاد فأولئك أسحاب النار هم فيها خالدون يمحق الله الربا ويربي الصدقات والله لا يحب كل كفر فار اثيم ان الذين امنوا وعملوا الصالحات واقاموا الصلاه واتوا الزكاه لهم اجرهم عند ربهم وَلَا خَوْفٌ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا هُمْ يَحْزَنُونَ يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا اتَّقُوا اللَّهَ وَذَرُوا مَا بَقِيَ مِنَ الرِّبَا إِن كُنْتُمْ فَإِن لَّمْ تَفْعَلُوا فَأَذَنُوا بِحَرْبٍ مِّنَ اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ فَإِن لَّمْ تَفْعَلُوا فَأَذَنُوا بِحَرْبٍ مِّنَ اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ وَإِن تُبْتُمْ فَلَكُمْ رَعُوسُ أَمْوَالِكُمْ لَا تَظْلِمُونَ وَلَا تُظْلَمُونَ وَإِن كَانَ ذُو عُشْرَةٍ فَنَظِرَةٌ إِلَى مَيْسَرَةٍ وَأَن تَصَدَّقُوا خَيْرٌ لَّكُمْ إِن كُنتُمْ تَعْلَمُونَ صَدَقَ اللَّهُ الْعَظِيمُ I seek refuge with Allah from Satan the accursed in the name of Allah most gracious most merciful Those who devour usury will not stand except as stands one whom the evil has driven to madness by his touch. That is because they say trade is like usury. But Allah has permitted trade and forbidden usury. Those who after receiving direction from their Lord desist shall be pardoned for the past their case is for God to judge but those who repeat the offense 
are companions of the fire. They will abide therein forever. God will deprive usury of all blessing, but will give increase for deeds of charity. For he loves not creatures ungrateful and wicked. Those who believe and do deeds of righteousness and establish regular prayers and regular charity will have their reward with their Lord. On them shall be no fear, and nor shall they grieve. O you who believe, fear God, and give up what remains of your demand for usury, if ye are indeed believers. If ye do it not, if ye do it not, take notice of war from Allah and His Messenger. But if ye turn back, you shall have your capital sums. Deal not unjustly, and ye shall not be dealt with unjustly. If the debtor is in a difficulty, grant him time till it is easy for him to repay. But if you remit by way of charity, that is the best for you, if you only knew. Verily, Allah speaks the truth. Assalamu alaikum. Those who have come in a bit later, I welcome you all to today's program once again. <coughs> Economy has played a very important role for people, especially in terms of social justice as well as social welfare and its connection to problems and solutions to mankind all over the world. In this context, we at the Islamic Research Foundation dealing on various topics where there has been a great rethinking going on internationally like women's rights, human rights uh, and uh, various kinds of social justices and systems. Economy is in under close scrutiny as far as total solutions are concerned because many of the international organizations like the World Bank and those of leading economists of the world have been after pursuit of total solutions because at present what systems are going on in the world they have been fraught with certain problems and inadequacies which because of administrative excellence have been covered up to quite an extent in this view, some people have been studying and have come forward to analyze Islamic economics. One of the main key points of Islamic economics is interest-free and its relevance to society and success of society today. To speak before you all, we have today, once again, Dr. Zakir Naik on the topic, interest-free economy promulgated by the Quran. He'll basically be talking on the principles and we will have a question answer session after that where we review the implementation. There are two factors which come into play when we study any system. One is the basic principle or the program and the second is how you're going to implement it. I would request Dr. Zakir to start his talk which will be followed by the question and answer session on the topic. Dr. Zakir Naik. Auzu billahi minash shaitanir rajeem. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu tuqullah wa zaru ma baqi min riba in kuntum mu'minin fa in lam tafalu fa zanu bi harb min Allahi wa rasulihi wa in tuktum fa lakum ru'usu wa amwalikum la تظلمون ولا تظلمون بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقهوا قولي I welcome all of you with Islamic greetings Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh 
May peace, mercy, and blessings of Almighty Allah be on all of you. The topic of today's talk, as mentioned by the Chairman, is interest-free economy promulgated by the Quran. The word riba is mentioned in the Quran no less than eight times. It's mentioned in Surah Room, chapter number 30, verse number 39. It's mentioned in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 161. It's mentioned in Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 130. It's mentioned thrice in the verse of Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 275. And in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 276. And in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 278. The word riba is mentioned in the Quran no less than eight different times. <coughs> the first time the word riba was revealed in the Quran was in Surah Rum, chapter number 30, verse number 39. It says that those who devour usury will have no increase with Allah. But those who give out in deeds of charity, seeking the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, will have increased, and they will have a recompense multiplied. The word riba, the Arabic word riba means an addition to or an increase over and above the original amount or the original size. In the Quran, it refers to as unlawful addition. And it means usury as well as interest. <clears throat> the first time the Quran mentioned in the chronological order, in the chronological order regarding riba, it does not say that it is prohibited. It only says, as I mentioned, in Surah Rum, chapter number 30, verse number 39, that those who give out in usury will have no increase with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But those who give out in deeds of charity will have increased and they shall have a recompense multiplied. Regarding riba, it is somewhat similar to what the Quran says about intoxicants. The prohibition of intoxicants was revealed in stages. The first time the Quran speaks about intoxicants is in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 219, and it says that when they ask he concerning intoxicants and gambling, tell them, in it is some profit but great sin. The sin is greater than the profit. The first time the Quran reveals regarding intoxicants, it only said that in it is great sin and some profit. The sin is greater than profit. It did not prohibit us from consuming intoxicants. Later on, the second verse of the Quran to be revealed regarding intoxicants was of Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 43, which says that approach not your prayers with a mind befogged. Approach not your prayers when you're intoxicated. Finally, the round was revealed regarding the prohibition of intoxicants in Surah Maida. Chapter number 5, verse number 90, which says, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amunu, O you who believe, inna mal khamru al maithuru, most certainly intoxicants and gambling, wal anzabu al aslamu, dedication of stones, divination of arrows, these are Satan's handiwork. These are abominations of Satan's handiwork. Abstain from such handiwork that you may prosper. After this verse was revealed, barrels of intoxicants were thrown on the streets of Medina, never to be filled again. So the prohibition of intoxicants came in stages, in the same fashion. The first time, 
the word riba was mentioned, it only said that you will have no increase with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The next verse to be revealed regarding riba was from Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 161, which says that for the iniquities of the Jews, we made for them unlawful certain foods which were good and wholesome and which were lawful to them. Because they hindered many from Allah's way. And they took usury which had been forbidden to them, which had been prohibited to them. So certain food, which is mentioned in the Quran, that is meat of camel, of sheep, of goat, fat of the ox, of the hare. These particular thing, the meat of the camel, the meat of the rabbit, and the meat of the hare, and the fat of the ox, the sheep, and the goat. Though it was good and wholesome, had been prohibited to the Jews, because they hindered many from Allah's way, and they took riba, they took usury, they took interest, though it was prohibited to them. Later on, the Quran says, in Surah Al-Imran, Chapter number 3, verse number 130, which says, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amunu, O you who believe, la taqulur riba, devour not usury, ad afam, muda afatan, doubled and multiplied. O you who believe, devour not usury, doubled and multiplied. But fear Allah, that you may really prosper. Here the Quran says that devour not usury, doubled and multiplied, but fear Allah that you may really prosper. But some of the Muslims may argue that the riba mentioned in the Quran only refers to usury, somewhat similar to what the money lenders when they gave loan to people and they took an exorbitant amount. Quran prohibits usury. But Quran does not prohibit interest, which the modern day banks take. Let's analyze what the meaning of usury and what the meaning of interest. According to the Oxford Dictionary, the word interest means amount paid for the use of amount lent. Money paid for the use of money lent. And usury. According to the Oxford Dictionary means the act or practice of lending money at interest, especially at a very high rate. So in short, usury means exorbitant interest. But as I mentioned earlier, riba means an addition to or an increase above the original amount of size. It is unlawful addition. And here it refers to both usury as well as interest, irrespective whether the rate is small or big. Riba, whether it be interest or usury, it has been prohibited in the Quran. Some Muslims may further argue that interest is like trade. So what is the harm in involving yourself dealing with interest? The answer to this argument is given clearly in the Quran. The same verse which was left, which was decided by Akari. The answer is given in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2. Verse number 275, he says that those who devour usury will not stand except as stands one who the evil one by his touch has driven to madness. This is because they say that trade is like usury, trade is like interest. Allah has permitted trade, but has forbidden riba, has forbidden usury, has forbidden interest. Those who after receiving the direction from thy Lord, desist, they shall be pardoned for the past. Their case is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to judge. 
but those who repeat the offense will be companions of the hellfire. Therein will they dwell forever. The Quran clearly states that Allah has permitted trade but has forbidden interest and riba. And those who involve themselves in riba, that is usury or interest, will be companions of the hellfire. And therein shall they dwell in forever. The verse continues. The next verse of Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 276 says, Allah will deprive riba. Allah will deprive usury of all its blessings and will give multiple increase for deeds of charity. Some Muslims may further argue that the riba mentioned in the Quran refers to riba istilaq. That is when a person gives a loan to another person to purchase his basic necessities to fulfill the basic demands of life. If a person gives loan and then charges interest on such loan, this sort of riba, which is called as riba istalaq, has been prohibited. The other sort of riba, the other interest which the modern banks take, interest giving on loans for doing business, this the Quran does not prohibit. Let's analyze what the Quran has to say. I start my talk by reciting a few verses of the Qur'an. I recited the verse from Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2. Verse number 278 which says, Ya ayyuhal Allah, That, O oh, you who believe, fear Allah. Wazaru ma baqi mina riba. And give up your demands. And give up your demands of riba. That is usury or interest. In kuntum mu'mineen, if ye are indeed believers, immediately after this voice was revealed, our beloved Prophet Muhammad may peace be upon him, he said that I am the first person to let go, to nullify the interest which is due to my relative, Hazrat Abbas bin Abdul Muttalib. May Allah be pleased with him. Previously, in the pre-Islamic Arabia, there were two types of business that was done. One was the mudariba system. That is, a person gave loan to a mudarib, to a, a businessman, to a person who's doing trade. And whatever profit that businessman had, it was shared between the person who gave loan and the businessman. And the second type was money was given to a businessman and a fixed interest was charged on that money. When the Muslims say that the riba which is prohibited in the Quran refers to riba istilaq, that is interest on loan givings to basic necessities like for purchasing food, for purchasing clothes, the basic requirements. Such type of riba has been prohibited. The moment the verse of Surah Baqarah chapter number 2, verse number 278 was revealed, which said that give up your demands of usury, give up your demands of riba, give up your demands of interest. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad may peace be upon him, he was the first to nullify, he was first to let go the interest that was due to his relative. Hazrat Abbas bin Abdul Muttalib, may Allah be pleased with him. No logical person, no logical Muslim can say that the beloved, the beloved relative of a prophet, Hazrat Abbas bin Abdul Muttalib, may Allah be pleased with him, he gave loan to poor people for basic needs and in return charged interest, just like what the Jews did. But natural, Hazrat Abbas bin Abdul Muttalib, may Allah be pleased with him, he gave loan to businessmen to do business and on that he charged a fixed interest. After this verse was revealed, whatever interest which was due to his relative was let go. And but natural, 
all the Muslims of that time, whoever involved themselves in interest, let go whatever interest amount was due to them. The next verse, immediately after this verse, is of Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 279, which says, after it says, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanatuk Allah, O you believe, fear Allah. Wazaru ma baqi min ar And give up what remains of your demands of usury. In kuntum mu'mineen, if you are indeed believers. And the next verse says, Fa'in, fa'in tawallaw. If, but if you do it not, Fa'zanu bi harbi min Allah ya wa rasulihi. Take notice of a war from Allah and His Rasul. Wa in tuptum. But if he turn back. Wa in tuptum. But if he turn back. You can have your capital sums. The Quran clearly states that if you do not turn back from riba, take notice of a war from Allah and His Rasul. Imagine. The Quran also mentions that intoxicants are prohibited. Gambling is prohibited. But nowhere does the Quran say that though consuming intoxicants is a major sin, it does not say that if you consume intoxicants, Allah and His Rasul will wage a war against you. Neither do you indulge. If you indulge in gambling, will Allah and His Rasul wage a war against you. But here specifically the Quran says, if you involve yourself in interest, Allah and His Rasul will wage a war against you. I want to know that which Muslim today in the world, in the world today, can challenge Allah and His Rasul for a war? I want to know which Muslim, which human being today in this world, can challenge Allah and His Rasul for a war? If you involve yourself in interest, in usury, you are challenging Allah and His Rasul for a war. And the next verse of Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 280 continues, that if the debtor is in difficulty, give him time to repay until it is easy for him to repay. But if he give it in deeds of charity, that is best for you. Regarding riba, the prohibition, has also been mentioned in several hadiths. It is clearly mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number 6, chapter number 48, 49, 50 and 51. That is hadith number 64, 65, 66 and 67. The first three hadiths, that is hadith number 64, 65 and 66 of volume 6 of Sahih Bukhari says, that Hazrat Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her, she narrated that after the last verses of Surah Baqarah was revealed to Allah's Messenger, may Allah be pleased with him, may peace be upon him, he went out and repeated that in the mosque and prohibited the trade of alcohol and liquor. And the last hadith, Hadith number 67 says that the hadith was narrated by Ibn Abbas, may Allah be pleased with him, that the last verses of the Quran to be revealed were verses prohibiting riba. These seven verses, that is from Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 275 to verse number 281, were the last seven verses of the Qur'an to be revealed. And immediately after the revelation, a few days later on, our beloved Prophet, may peace be upon him, he expired. That's the reason that the companion did not have much time to know the minute details of the implication of the Sharia. And it's mentioned in the commentary of Ibn Qasir that Hazrat Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, he said he had wished that the beloved Prophet had thrown more light on three things. One being riba 
and the other two being Khilafa and Kalala. That is how a property of a diseased person who has no relatives, how it should be divided, which is mentioned in Surah Nisa chapter 4 verse number 12. But from the hadiths you can come to know clearly, besides the mention in the Quran, it's also mentioned in the Sahih Hadiths. If you read the index, that is the glossary of Sahih Bukhari in volume 1, under the topic of riba, it said riba is of two types. Riba nasiya, that is loan given to a person for business and interest charged on that loan. And riba fadal, that is exchanging a superior quality of good in turn for a bigger quantity of inferior quality of good, irrespective it may be gold, silver, foodstuff, etc. And it says all types of riba are prohibited. The prohibition of riba is also clearly mentioned in Sahih Muslim in volume 3, in chapter number 623, hadith number 3845 to 3849. Five hadiths which clearly mention in Sahih Muslim that riba is prohibited. Let us analyze what are the objectives of the Islamic economic order? Why does Quran promulgate an interest-free economy? There are basically four objectives for an interest-free economy promulgated by the Quran. The first is the economic well-being within the framework of the moral norms of Islam. The second is universal brotherhood and justice. The third is equitable distribution of wealth. And the fourth is individual freedom within the context of social welfare. <coughs> Let's analyze the first objective that is economic well-being within the framework of the moral norms of Islam. The Quran mentioned in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 68, that eat and drink of the sustenance provided by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and create no mischief or evil on the face of the earth. A similar thing is repeated. In Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse 160, which says that each of the producers of the earth and follow not the footsteps of the evil one, for he is to you an avowed enemy. It's further mentioned in Surah Jummah, chapter number 62. Verse number 10, that after the prayer is finished, disperse ye in the land to seek the bounties of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. From these verses you can realize that the Quran encourages the people to enjoy the bounties of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to enjoy the good things which Allah has provided for you. It is mentioned in the hadith, narrated on the authority of al bayaki that the person who seeks the world lawfully to cater to the need of a family, to avoid begging and to be kind to his neighbor will meet Allah with a shining face like the full moon. Begging has been discouraged in Islam. It's also mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, chapter number 2, sorry, volume number 2, page number 133, that the hand that is above is better than the hand that is below. It's also mentioned in the hadith of Ibn Majah, volume 2, page number 723. It says 
that the best income a person can earn is through his labor. So Islam encourages the person to enjoy the bounties of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to work for his living and to refrain from begging. The second objective is universal brotherhood and justice. The best verse that I can quote to you from the Quran regarding universal brotherhood is from Surah Al-Hujurat, chapter number 49. Verse number 13, which says that, O oh humankind, we have created you from a single pair of a male and female and have divided you into nations and tribes so that you shall recognize each other, not that you shall despise each other. And the most honored in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the person who is the most righteous is the person who is the most pious. From this verse you come to know the criteria for judgment in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is not sex, it is not wealth, it is not caste, it is not color, but it is taqwa. It is God consciousness. It is piety. Further we also come to know that during the speech of the farewell pilgrimage of Hajjatul Vida, our beloved Prophet Muhammad, may peace be upon him, he said that no Arab is superior to a non Arab, neither a white is superior to a black, except in righteousness, except in piety, except in God consciousness. The best words that I can quote from the Quran regarding justice is from Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 135, which says that, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amunu, O you who believe, stand out firmly for justice as witness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even if it be against yourself, against your parents, against your relatives, or the rich or poor. For Allah protects all. Means if you have to stand for truth, if you have to stand for haq, if you have to give a witness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you can even go against yourself. You have to sacrifice your own interest. You can even go against your parents, against the relatives, or irrespective of the person who you are going against is rich or poor. You have to stand firmly for justice as witness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The third objective is equitable distribution of the income, of the wealth. Islam is again the philosophy that the wealth should be concentrated in the hands of few individuals. And the difference between the rich and the poor should be reduced. Otherwise, they will be enemies unto each other. For this, Islam has devised a system called a zakat. That every Muslim who has a saving, who has a wealth of more than the nisab level, more than the minimum wealth required, he has to pay 2.5%, one fortieth of that wealth every lunar year to the poor people. And the categories to whom zakat can be given has been clearly listed in the Quran in Surah Tawbah, chapter number 9, verse number 60, which says that zakat can be, give, zakat can be given to a fuqara, to a person who is poor. It can be given to a masakin, a person who is needy. It can be given to Amilun, a person who is engaged in collecting and distributing the zakat. It can be given to Muwalla Fatukulub, those whose hearts, those whose hearts are inclined towards Islam, that is the converts or the reverts. It can be given to the Rikab, that is the captives. It 
can be given to the Garimun, that is, the one who has taken loan, can be given to the debtor. The seventh category is Ibn Sabil, that is the wayfarer, the traveler. Even though he's rich, if he gets stranded in a foreign land, and if he does not have money to go back or for his sustenance, you can give him out of the zakat money. And the last category is Fisa Bilillah, in the way of Allah. And this last category is further subdivided. In this category of Fisa Bilillah, it can be given to a person who is giving religious education, person who is acquiring religious education, the person who is involved in doing jihad in the way of Allah, striving, struggling, doing holy war in the way of Allah. It can be given to a da'i. It can be also given to a person who is obtaining the secular education. The several categories. This system of zakat has been specified. The reason which is given in the Quran in Surah Al-Hashar, chapter number 59, verse number 7, to prevent the wealth from circulating amongst the wealthy and rich. The zakat has been devised to prevent the wealth from circulating amongst the rich and the wealthy. If every individual in this world practices the system of zakat, there will not be a single human being who will die of hunger in this world. Unfortunately, even the Muslims don't give the correct zakat that is due to them. They may give part of it, only a small percentage. If every Muslim in this world gives zakat correctly, there will not be a single Muslim below the poverty line. Islam teaches that to find lawful employment to the person who is unemployed and to give him a good remuneration for the work he does. The Quran also says that after a person dies, his wealth should be divided according to the guidelines laid in the Quran in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 11, 12, and verse number 176. It should not go to one or two individuals of the society, how it is done today that whatever wealth is remaining of a person who dies, it goes to one or two individuals. But the Quran specifies the wealth should be distributed according to the guidelines laid in the Quran. The fourth objective is individual freedom within the context of the social welfare. <coughs> According to Islam, a man is born free. No one, not even the state, can abrogate his freedom, nor subject his life to strict regimentation. Every individual is free as long as he does not overstep his freedom, as long as he does not harm the society. Because in Islam, the larger welfare of the society takes precedence over the individual freedom. Working and labor, working and labor as well as the benefit in business are both important principles of the Sharia. But the first, the former, takes precedence over the latter. And if you are doing business, or whatever it is, a big loss, a big loss cannot be inflicted to relieve a small loss. Neither can a big profit be sacrificed for a small profit. So in short, Islam believes in individual freedom within the context of the social welfare. 
there are several evils of the interest based economy the reason why quran has prohibited it for example if a person takes loan from the bank and say the cost price of a particular article is 100 rupees he wants 10 rupees profit on that article so the selling price will include the 100 rupees cost price the 10 rupees profit as well as the interest is paying say it is rupees 10 so the selling price will be 120 rupees the selling price will go up because of interest if the selling price goes up but natural the demand comes down when the demand comes down the supply goes down when supply goes down but natural the production comes down when the production comes down there is retrenchment and there is labor problem this problem of employment there are a lot of social injustice for example if a person takes loan from the bank irrespective whether he makes a profit or goes in loss he has to pay that fixed amount of interest in the time stipulated even if some calamity before the family like flood earthquake etc still the person who has taken loan has to pay that amount along with interest there is no social there is there is social injustice irrespective whether the businessman goes in loss or profit he has to pay that amount there is no social consideration also for example if two businessmen if two businessmen they come to ask for a loan from a bank from the modern bank <coughs> one businessman wants to open an alcohol factory and the other businessman wants to start a school but natural the person starting an alcohol factory will have better returns and the loan given to him will be more secured and he will give a higher rate of interest as compared to the other businessman who wants to start a school or an hospital there is no social consideration the modern bank is only interested in getting bigger returns it's not bothered whether you open an alcohol factory or a gambling den or a school or a hospital that's the reason that if you analyze in the 80s most of the modern banks they financed gambling dens that's the reason you you will find that hundreds and thousands of gambling dens had been opened in the 80s throughout the world all the banks financed gambling dens gambling dens gambling dens do theoretically the modern banker will tell you that even we have social consideration and for name sake he may give a loan to a few social projects but majority of his loan that we analyze are not based on social consideration it's based on better interest according to the modern banking it encourages a person to store money it encourages a person to keep the money idle that you invest that you keep so much money in the bank and you get a fixed return of 10% or 12% every year it encourages a person to store money and lastly the power is concentrated in the hands of few people that is the bankers that's the reason that a small percentage of people that is a small community that is the jews which are controlling the major modern banks of the world today they are controlling the full world the power today is mainly in the hands of the jews because though they are negligible in percentage they are controlling most of the modern banks so because of the modern banking system power is concentrated in the hands of few individuals same way there are several benefits of the islamic banking firstly 
no interest is involved. It's based on profit and loss. So if a person wants to sell his good, it will only have the cost price and the profit. Instead of 120 rupees, his selling price will be 110 rupees. If the selling price comes down, the demand increases. If the demand increases, but naturally supply increases. Supply increases, the production increases. And but natural, there is more labor for the people. And it encourages the people to work and to strive. It encourages a people to earn the living. It has social justice. That if a businessman takes a loan, if he goes in loss, the loss is shared by the bank. If he goes in profit, the profit is shared by the bank. And if he takes a loan, and if certain calamity befalls him, but natural, the Islamic bank gives him more time to repay, not like the modern bank. The more later you pay, you have to pay a bigger penalty. In the Islamic bank, they give more time. And many a time, if they find the situation very bad, they also let go of that loan. There is social consideration. You cannot give loan to any businessman who is doing any activity against the Islamic Sharia. Any activity which is causing harm to the society. For example, if a businessman wants to open an alcohol factory and if he approaches an Islamic bank, irrespective, even if the businessman says, I will give you 100% of my profit, still the Islamic bank will not give a single pie loan to that businessman because he wants to start a project which is harmful to the society, which is against the Sharia. So in the Islamic banking, there is social consideration. And they encourage more, the Islamic bank, they encourage more of the projects which are beneficial to the society. For example, building of schools, building of hospitals, building of nurseries, etc. In short, the Islamic bank encourages the society to improve. <clears throat> In Islamic bank, you aren't encouraged to keep your money idle. You're encouraged to invest your money and be a partner in the business. And lastly, the power is not concentrated in the hands of a few individuals. Because here, the profit and loss is shared by the businessman, by the banker, as well as the depositor. The power is shared equally between all the people. It's not concentrated in the hands of the few people. The great philosopher Aristotle, he has given a beautiful definition of interest. And Aristotle defines interest as an earning based on the use of money and not on labor. And all such earnings are against nature. According to Aristotle, interest is an earning based on the use of money, not on labor. And all such earnings, that is, all such interest are against nature. Let's analyze the modern theory and the Islamic theory. There are mainly four factors that are involved in production. The first is land, second is labor, third is capital, and fourth is organization. According to the modern theory, on land, you pay rent. In the Islamic theory, you do the same. On land, you pay rent. <clears throat> In the second factor of production, that is labor. In the modern theory, you pay wages. In the Islamic theory also you pay wages, it's the same. In the third factor of production, that is capital, in the modern theory you pay interest. In the Islamic theory there is profit and loss sharing. And in the fourth factor of production, that is organization, in the modern theory there is profit and loss sharing, in the Islamic theory there is profit and loss sharing. So the major difference in the four factors of production is the third factor that is capital. The modern theory says that on the capital, you have to charge a fixed interest. The Islamic theory says 
that on the capital there is profit and loss sharing. Because Islam does not differentiate between the capital and the organization. Because the money that is lent by the bank, the money actually does not belong to the bank. It belongs to the depositors. So depositors are part of organization. Therefore, the money that is given, borrowed from the bank, the money which is deposited in the bank, this money, this capital should be included in the organization. That is the reason capital and organization in the Islamic theory, they are clubbed together. And it is based on profit and loss sharing. In the modern theory, capital, on the capital you have interest. This is the major difference. The five basic principles of the Islamic banking are, the first is Tawheed, that is belief in one God, that is unity of God. <coughs> the second is divine, divine origin of nourishment and direction towards perfection. The third, it is Khilafah. We have to realize that man is the wise gerund of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the face of the earth. The fourth is Taskiya, that is purification and growth. And last is accountability, that we have to believe in the hereafter. And we will be accountable on the day of judgment. Islamic banking is mainly based on these five principles. When you have to do business, normally there are two types of unit. One is the surplus unit which has got excess of money but does not know how to utilize it. The other is the deficit unit. That is, those people who have got no money but have got very good ideas. The best example in Islamic history I can give you of a surplus and a deficit unit is the Hazrat Khatija, may Allah be pleased with her, who was the wife of beloved Prophet Muhammad, may peace be upon him. She is a very good example of a surplus unit. She had excess of wealth. But since she was a lady, but naturally she could not go abroad and involve too much in the business transaction. She did not have avenues to invest her money. And the example of the deficit unit is our beloved Prophet Muhammad, may peace be upon him. That is deficit in the terms of money. He did not have much wealth, but he had a lot of ideas. So both these units combined, the surplus and the deficit unit. Bibi Khatija, may Allah be pleased with her. She gave a money to Prophet Muhammad, may peace be upon him, to do business. And whatever Prophet they obtained, it was shared on the ratio that was predetermined. The best example you have in Islamic history of a deficit and a surplus unit. Let's analyze the system of modern banking and Islamic banking. Let's first analyze the options open for an individual to deposit the money in an Islamic bank. The first type of account you have for deposit account is the current account. It is called as Vadia Infix. That you deposit your money in the Islamic bank, in the current account. That money which the Islamic bank takes, it utilizes that money with your permission. You give permission to the bank to utilize that money. But if the bank goes in loss, the loss is not shared by the depositor. If the bank goes in profit, neither is the profit shared by the depositor. The depositor only keeps the money for safety. It's called as amana. He keeps his wealth for safety. He is not interested in profit, neither in loss. He keeps his money for safety. And Islamic Sharia gives the permission that you are allowed to keep your money as a manat with anyone and you can utilize it. At the same time, the Islamic bank gives you a check and a slip book. 
But naturally, with the checkbook, you can withdraw money whenever you want. And with the slip book, you can put in money whenever you want, similar to the modern bank. Coming to the second type of deposit account, it is a savings account. In the savings account, here also, the depositor is mainly interested in the safety of his money. He is not interested in profit and loss. And whatever profit the bank obtains from that money, the depositor does not mind accepting a part of it. The Sharia says, whatever profit you obtain from a business, you have a right to give a part of it as gift, a part of it as gift to anyone. It's called a satka. You can give a satka. So here you deposit your money in the Islamic bank and whatever profit the bank makes, the bank gives you a portion of the profit. But you cannot demand a fixed amount of profit. It's not allowed in Islam. Whatever the bank gives, you have to accept it. And the remaining profit, it's considered as you have given it back to the bank. You have a right to give back your profit to whoever you wish, according to the Islamic Sharia. So these two accounts, the current account and the savings account, the depositors are mainly interested in the safety of the money. They aren't interested in profit. The other type of account that you have, are the investment accounts or in the modern banks they are similar to the fixed deposit account and this are further divided into several types in the Islamic system in the Islamic banking system you have the mudareba which means profit and loss sharing that the person the depositor Keeps, keeps an amount for a fixed period of time. The period of time may be multiples of three months. It can be three months, it can be six months, it can be nine months, it can be twelve months. This example I'm giving you of the Islamic banking is based on the Islamic banking in Malaysia. The best banking that you have today, the Islamic banking you have today in the world is the Malaysian banking. There is no better Islamic banking anywhere in the world than the Islamic banking followed in Malaysia. In the other countries, they partly follow Islamic banking, partly they don't. But the 100% system, which I have in my knowledge, the only country which is following 100% to the minutest detail is in Malaysia. So this concept, I'm telling you, is based on the Islamic system of banking in Malaysia. In this investment account, that's called a mudariba, you keep a fixed amount of wealth for a fixed period, maybe for three months, for six months, nine months, twelve months, or whatever it is, multiples of three months. Some banks keep it for multiples of four months. This money, in turn, is used by the bank to do business with the businessman. So in the terminology, when you deposit your money in the bank, the depositor is called as sahib -e mal and the bank is called as sahib -e amal Here the surplus unit is the depositor. The deficit unit is the Islamic bank. Now whatever profit the Islamic bank makes, it is shared on a predetermined ratio. The profit which the Islamic bank makes or the money you have deposited for the fixed period, it's shared on the ratio which is determined. In the Islamic banking of Malaysia, the ratio is seven parts to three parts. Seven parts of the profit is given to the depositor, three parts of the profit is, is kept with the bank. Means seventy percent of the profit goes to the depositor and thirty percent the Islamic bank keeps for itself. For example, if you deposit one thousand rupees in the Islamic Bank of Malaysia for one year, and the bank makes a profit of hundred rupees. So bank will give you 70 rupees of the profit and will keep 30 rupees of the profit. But natural the capital also you get back. But the profit will get 70 percent, 70 rupees. And the bank will give 30 rupees. If the bank makes a profit of 500 rupees, the bank keeps 30 percent of 500 rupees, that is 150 rupees. 
and gives you 70% of the profit. That is, gives you 350 rupees. So, bigger the profit, bigger is the share of, of the depositor as well as the bank. Lesser is the profit, lesser is the share of the depositor as well as the bank. It is profit sharing. If the profit is zero rupees, the bank gets zero, the depositor gets zero. But suppose in case the bank goes in loss, according to the Mudariba system, the loss is borne only by the depositor. The loss in the business is theoretically only borne by the depositor. Means, for example, if you invest 1000 rupees and keep it for one year, there is a loss of 100 rupees. So you, in turn, the loss is transferred to you. And from your capital, out of the 1000 rupees, you only get 900 rupees back. 100 rupees is deducted as loss. <coughs> so in theoretical terms, the loss is only borne by the depositor. But practically, even the Islamic bank is going in loss. Because, but natural, they are paying the money for the administration, for the rent, for the salary, which is not taken into account. So, but natural, even the bank is not going scot-free. Even the bank is sharing a loss, though it is a lesser percentage as compared to the depositor. This is the system in the Islamic banking. Now, let's come to the project financing. Suppose a businessman, he wants a loan. He wants money from the Islamic bank. The first system is the Mudariba system. That is, a businessman comes to the bank and says that <coughs> I have a project of six months. And this project requires 50,000 rupees. At the end of six months, I will make, I will get a return of one lakh rupees. That is, 50,000 rupees profit. Is the Islamic bank willing to give me 50,000 rupees for six months? But naturally, the Islamic bank analyzes the business. What sort of business is he doing? Is, is the business viable? What is the profit return, etc., etc.? Then, the Islamic bank and the entrepreneur and the businessman, they sit across the table and they finalize the ratio of profit that they should share. Say, for example, the Islamic bank says, I will take three parts of the profit, the businessman gets two parts of the profit. Means, 60% of the profit, whatever the businessman is making, will go to the Islamic bank, 40% will go to the entrepreneur, to the businessman. The deal is fixed, it can be negotiated. In the modern bank, the interest is negotiated. In the Islamic bank, the profit ratio is negotiated. So the businessman says, I require 50,000 for doing business for six months. In that 50,000, also, if he's working for his business, his salary is included. If he's not working, if he employs other people only, his salary is not included. But if he also works, say for example, an average person working may require 2,000 per month. So, he gets paid 2,000 per month from that 50,000 rupees. For six months it will come, six multiplied by 2,000, he gets 12,000 rupees at the end of six months. This is taken into account, and the remaining, the remaining money, the remaining 38,000 of the 50,000 is utilized on buying of goods and the administration. So from the 50,000, even 12,000 salary of that entrepreneur for six months is taken into account. Now after six months, he makes a profit of 50,000. He gets the total return of 1 lakh rupees. But natural, the capital sum of 50,000 is, is given back to the bank. And the remaining 50,000 profit is shared on the profit ratio predetermined. Bank, Islamic bank, takes 60%. That is 30,000 rupees. And the businessman keeps 40% of 20,000 rupees. So at the end of six months, the businessman gets 20,000 rupees profit as well as 12,000 rupees salary for his labor. If instead of making 50,000 profit, the businessman makes 40,000 profit. So the bank takes 60% of 40,000. That is 24,000 rupees. And the businessman, he takes 40% of the 40,000. He keeps 16,000. If the businessman makes 60,000 profit, 
the bank keeps 60 percent of 60,000. That is 36,000 rupees as profit. And the businessman keeps 40 percent. That is 24,000 rupees of the profit. So bigger the profit, bigger the share for the Islamic bank as well as the businessman. Lesser is the profit, lesser is the share for the businessman and the bank.